Hello, I am Dr. R.D. Kare, pediatrician from Mumbai. Today, we will revise our knowledge about splenomegaly. Spleen is not uncommon in a sick or diseased person. For palpation of spleen, when the spleen is moderately big, it is not a big deal, easy to palpate. We know that it has a notch and it identifies. Important things are if by chance the left lobe of liver is very big, then it may produce a little difficulty, it may mimic spleen. Or if the renal tumor is significantly just coming in front anteriorly, then it may be mistaken for splenomegaly. But the point is that you should not be able to insinuate your finger between the swelling and the uh, and the costal margin in a splenomegaly and this is an important point. Now just palpable spleen. We should take care not to miss just palpable spleen and therefore we should follow all the precautions which means that the patient is lying relaxed on his back and the hip, hip joint and the knees are flexed. If necessary he can be turned to right lateral position. Our palm should be uh, warm and should be kept on abdomen maybe about two inches below the left costal margin and we should press gently with the palm and not poke our fingers in otherwise the patient will do guarding with the abdominal muscles and ask the patient to breathe slowly and deep or in the child you wait for child to inspire the spleen will come touch your fingers and go back and this is a very easy technique not to miss a just palpable spleen. It may be important to feel a just palpable spleen in some of the diseases because we may be able to predict the course of the disease a little later. Small amount of spleen, maybe one or maximum two centimeters, may be normal up to six months of age. Otherwise, splenomegaly almost always is associated with some disease. Now, we could consider for diagnosis of splenomegaly, the cause of splenomegaly, associated symptoms. By itself, splenomegaly will rarely give us a diagnosis. There are one or two conditions which we will see a little later. So let us say first associated with fever. And when we say fever, it is what strikes our mind first is infections. So infections associated with fever. Acute infections, you all are aware, enteric fever, early onset of malaria, infectious mononucleosis or maybe in some cases septicemia or maybe other disorders where the spleen may be palpable early. In such case, it is important to feel the spleen at that time. Now, in order to know most of the causes where the list is very long, we should consider under acute infections subacute or chronic infections, bacterial, viral, protozoal, etc, etc. But for us it is important that we have that classification in mind and we may consider important things. We just saw the acute inflammation giving rise to a splenomegaly which may be often just palpable. Amongst the chronic infections, I would like to stress tuberculosis. In tuberculosis, febrile manifestations are not so striking, but the constitutional manifestations are more prominent, like ill health, lethargy, not doing well, loss of appetite. And here, palpable of spleen gives an additional information that this is likely to be a disseminated sclerosis, tuberculosis, like a miliary tuberculosis. Now we come to other causes of inflammation, but not necessarily infection. We have considered the infection, but we know that inflammation can occur in non-infective cases. To take an example, rheumatological disease, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematous, or different kinds of rheumatological disease often has a spleen which is palpable. This is because the screen is also important taking part in inflammatory disease and palpation of spleen in these diseases gives us an additional confirmation or additional diagnosis. Other inflammatory conditions may be histiocytosis or some such disorders also may give rise to enlargement of spleen. So these are inflammatory disorders, not infections, but they are important in the diagnosis either 
for expanding the diagnosis or localizing the diagnosis, this may be important. Another important association between which we all know is pallor. That means hematological causes. Quite often you will find the spleen is a large associated pallor is there. And among the hematological causes we are all aware that hemolytic anemia would occur to our mind first. The, uh, the thalassemia, the sickle cell anemia, the hereditary sclerocytosis, some cases of G6PD deficiency and therefore pallor and splenomegaly is hematological diseases as one of the important things that we kept in mind. Other hematological disorders which are not hemolytic anemia that we can consider are when the bone marrow is not functioning to its best extent then spleenic has to take the function of hemopoiesis and therefore osteosclerosis or marble bone disease which is an osteopetrosis has a splenomegaly as a significant uh, enlargement and therefore in hematological conditions which are not hemolytic anemias this may be also considered acute leukemias and lymphomas are other disorders if you consider them as hematological they may be associated with significant splenomegaly of course the associated findings like a pallor, patiki, purpura, sometimes joint pains, bone pains are also important. These are usually sick children, especially in acute leukemia. So having considered pallor and fever as an associated thing, we now go to the third important category, which is portal hypertension. We know that spleen has got venous sinuses and therefore these venous sinuses will reflect the portal pressure. So we have three varieties of portal hypertension. The pre-sinusoidal, which used to previously called as extrahepatic portal hypertension, intrahepatic portal hypertension, and post-sinusoidal. Pre-sinusoidal portal hypertension is not uncommon. The important thing to be remembered about it is, this is the only manifestation of the disease. There may be no fever, no pallor. If the patient has not had vomiting or hematemesis, there will be no other clue, just a spleen in a normal looking person, usually a child of three or so four years. Mm -hmm. And when you think of it, then you will ask for sonography and then you will see the esophageal varices and clinch the diagnosis. This is one condition where spleen is just isolated and we have to keep that in mind. Then this is prehepatic. Hepatic causes of, you know, any cause of cirrhosis or sclerosis, Wilson's disease, alpha 1 aptitude deficiency, and other causes of cirrhosis will produce sinusoidal or post sinusoidal fibrosis, giving rise to increased pressure in the portal vein and therefore splenomegaly. And pre suppose sinusoidal, that means Bursiari syndrome in children or congestive cardiac failure, constrictive pericarditis are also important where there is significant hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. So the third group as we saw is portal hypertension associated with splenomegaly. Now we consider other two, three uh, groups of disorders which may be relatively less common. One is storage disease, like point storage disease, like Gauchers or Neiman pick or maybe histiocytosis X or GM1 gangliocytosis where dif different kinds of lipid or other materials are stored in the liver and the spleen and therefore you get a significant splenomegaly. Then we may consider some of the conditions which are there because of abnormality of spleen itself. For example, a splenic tumor, splenic cyst or an abscess in the spleen. Spleen is very rarely tender. When it is tender and enlarged, there are very few things that we can see and that is uh, abscess of the spleen or there may be some ischemic areas of the skin or perisplenitis and these are cases of tender spleen. We may also remember one or two other conditions where there is a splenomegaly and that is tropical splenomegaly. Then there are two terms like Banty syndrome and Feltis spleen. Feltis spleen is nothing but palpable spleen in a rheumatological disorder and Banty syndrome is we have considered as a portal hypertension. Tropical splenomegaly is when in a tropical area where malaria is endemic, 
in the person who has got recurrent attacks of malaria and who is immunocompromised then instead of producing antibodies IgM antibodies are produced and these antibodies give rise to enlargement of spleen without producing antibodies to are protecting the uh, disease against it. So they are significant spleenomegaly but they don't have protection against malaria and all that you get is that the patient has pallor because this enlarged spleen also performs as function of uh, RBC hemolysis and decrease in the platelets also so he has anemia, thrombocytopenia and he has significant uh, splenomegaly and the peripheral smear does not show malarial parasite but if you do the IgM levels they are very high and it is to be treated with long term anti-malarial treatment. So we have considered almost all the causes which are associated with uh, splenomegaly. The important messages are that splenomegaly by itself may not give the diagnosis but is the associated symptoms that are important and therefore we must group them into infections, portal hypertension, hematological disease, storage disease, malignancy, for example myelosclerosis, chronic myeloid leukemia. If you see a very huge spleen, there are only four or five causes of a huge spleen. One is chronic hemolytic anemia, portal hypertension, chronic myeloid leukemia, myelosclerotic disorders, these are four or five important causes or maybe osteofibrosis, osteosclerosis. These are, so huge spleen has a small differential balance. This summarizes our approach to a splenomegaly, a quite an important physical finding, especially in the diseased person. Thank you very much.